Penguins of the Southern Hemisphere are birds that capture the interest and love of many, ditching the bird's staple ability of flight in order to become well adapted to surviving in the harsh waters of the Southern Hemisphere. Many people have probably wondered why we don't see penguins in the Northern Hemisphere, excluding the Galapagos penguins, they're an exception. The truth is, a penguin-like bird did once inhabit the waters of the North Atlantic, and it didn't only live in these waters, but it thrived. But this bird wasn't a penguin, but instead it was the great auk, the lost ruler of the Atlantic. Also stick around as I will also explain why we don't have penguins in the Northern Hemisphere. Now I usually start these videos with a setting the stage section where I give a brief breakdown of the environment of the topic, but in this case, the great auk was all over the Northern Atlantic. Great auks inhabited most of the Northern Atlantic, spanning a coastal range spanning across the entire east coast of America, from Florida all the way up to Labrador and Canada, stretching past Greenland and Iceland, and the northernmost coast of Sweden and went as far down as parts of Northern Africa and went into the Mediterranean as far as Italy. Great auks would occasionally appear on the coasts, but they preferred flat rocky islands far from the mainlands, using these islands to mate and nest eggs, living in large social colonies. Great auks are larger than average penguins, standing at about 33 inches tall and weighing up to 11 pounds. And Although they closely resemble the penguin, they are even also referred to as penguins by European centuries ago, great auks are not related to penguins at all. The great auks are related to, well, you probably guessed it, other auks, such as the razorbill, murs, puffins, and the little auk, who, unlike the great auk, all possess the ability to fly. Great auks are a great example of convergent evolution, evolving to closely resemble penguins on the other side of the planet in complete isolation from each other. Great auks were efficient underwater hunters to say the least, spending vast amounts of their time in pursuit of prey, and using bursts of speed to catch fish and picking apart crustaceans and other marine invertebrates. Their fatty bodies and sleek feathers allowed them to be buoyant and to manage their heat regulation very well in the cold, harsh waters of the Atlantic. And although they were well developed for the water, they were notably quite clumsy and slow on land, making them easy pickings for predators. These predators would include seagulls, white-tailed eagles, sharks, foxes, the biggest op on land, the polar bear, the biggest op in the water, the orca, and the biggest fuck you of all time, human beings. Human predation of great auks can be dated as far back as 100,000 years ago, with Neanderthals being known to hunt them, and this beautiful cave art of a great auk can be found in Pasquere Cave in France, and is estimated to be about 20,000 years old. Great auks also held great significance to Native Americans who lived along the eastern coast, serving as a great food source, fishing bait, and served symbolic importance, with the bones and beaks being present in burial sites. From the Pleistocene about half a million years ago up to a few hundred years ago, great auk pet populations were estimated to be in the millions, but today none can be found. So what happened to the great auk? Now many things led to the Great Auk's extinction, but the first major factor that led to the end of the Great Auk was changes in their climate. About 12,000 years ago, when the last ice age ended, sea levels began to rise, slowly covering coastal regions with water slowly over time. This led to many Great Auk breeding grounds disappearing, causing them to search for new islands to best suit their needs. Fast forward to the early 1400s, and an event known as the Little Ice Age would have a pronounced impact on the Northern Atlantic region, leading to sea ice covering vast amounts of the ocean and creating many ice bridges. Not only did this ice occasionally cover the nesting islands that the Great Auk colonies relied on, and would sometimes even make them uninhabitable, they would also allow land predators such as foxes and polar bears access to these otherwise out of reach islands basically giving them an all-you-can-eat buffet out of this colony. A far more dire threat to the auk, however, would stem from human hunting. 
Ox have been hunted for food for thousands of years, but since these hunts were mainly beach ambushes far from their island refuges, their population wasn't at a massive risk. But once sailors who were starved after grueling months out at sea would discover these islands full of flightless birds, it would be devastating for the great auk. Many extinctions have occurred at the hands of starved sailors massacring entire species out of a desire for a fresh food source, and the defenseless great auk would be easy pickings for many of these sailors. Thankfully, the great auk's range was still pretty massive with many colonies scattered across the Atlantic, so the population wasn't severely devastated from hungry sailors. But eventually, the hunting would ramp up to an insane degree, but not for their meat. The great auk's feathers, and most notably their down, was highly sought out for their use in pillows, clothing, and in decorations. And the demand for the auk's feathers would lead to a systematic hunting that would be a devastating hit to their population. Great auk eggs were also highly sought for for food, and for egg collecting as well. With all of the ships reaching these islands, ship rats would also devour said eggs. Oh, and I forgot to mention that great ox can only lay one egg per mating season, so yeah, this can easily snowball out of control, and it did. Noticing the systemic hunting, several naturalists and conservationists like Sir William Jardine, John Woolley, and Alfred Newton would all warn the people that their overhunting would lead to the utter extinction of this animal. But their words fell on deaf ears, at least until it was too late. Fast forward to the 1800s, and the once vast auk population was whittled down to a single colony that found refuge on the islet of Gurfelglasker. I do not know if I said that right, but it was also known as the Great Auk Rock, which I like that way more, off of the coast of Iceland. The island's harsh winters and dark folklore deterred humans from visiting, giving the Great Auk a refuge and a second chance at survival. This grace period would be interrupted by an eruption in 1830 that would destroy the islet and whittle down the colony to 30 mating pairs. The remaining auks would spend the rest of their days living on a nearby island known as Eldi, whose rough waters made it very risky for human hunters to reach. Tragically, many scientists and collectors of the time would become infatuated with the great auk, requesting their bodies for taxidermy and for studying. And once the great auks were discovered on the island, it was too late, as the, over the years, sailors with promise of small fortunes for each bird would pick away at the colony until in 1844, when the last breeding pair of auks would be killed while incubating an egg. And in 1852, there was a supposed final sighting of the great auk, and after that, it would go extinct. It was believed that there were more colonies to the north, but this was merely just wishful thinking. The great auk was one of the first animals that many Europeans would witness go extinct due to overhunting, with the concept being relatively new. The 80 odd surviving taxidermies are a dark reminder of the consequences of our actions, as every single one of them is thought to have been part of that final colony that lived on LD Island, ripped away from their nesting grounds by desperate men who were hired by men desperate to know more about the bird that they would be responsible for completely killing off. Now, the subject of de-extinction is a very interesting discussion, as many environmental shifts are due to animals vanishing and leaving niches empty. Many scientists believe that bringing back extinct animals who we've wiped out is our wrong to right, and it can help heal ecosystems as well. And one potential candidate for de-extinction is none other than the Great Auk. Scientists would basically genetically engineer members of the great auk's closest living relatives, the razorbill, to become more like an auk in appearance, giving them larger bodies and shorter flightless wings. De-extinction is a pretty controversial topic, as in cases such as the great auk and a more popular one being the dodo bird, the animals that are created 
aren't clones of the bird. They're not these birds at all. Instead, it is a modified creature made to resemble what once was these extinct animals. Is it our responsibility to recreate entire animals? Is it really our duty to do this? Are we playing God? What do you think? Make sure to comment down below what you think about it. Now, to get all the, the dark stuff out of there, you know, all the depressing extinction talk, let's, uh, let's talk about that one thing I promised. How come uh, no penguins have come up to the Northern Hemisphere outside of the Galapagos dudes? For starters, most penguins are better suited for the cold, nutrient-rich waters of the Antarctic, making venturing into warmer currents undesirable and outright just dangerous. And also, penguins are just not built for intense migrations to this degree. Sure, they are adapted to travel long distances, but not long, grueling swims all the way up to the northern Atlantic, treading the dangerous open oceans and resting on very risky shores. Galapagos penguins are the only penguin known to live north of the equator, and they've managed to do so by adapting to the Galapagos Islands, whose nutrient-rich waters allow them a suitable environment to live. And even if penguins were just kind of airdropped into the North Atlantic Ocean, like say near the Arctic or something, they would still struggle to adapt. Not only would predator whales like orcas that penguins are familiar with be big trouble for them, but other animals such as, I feel like a beluga would eat them. You think a beluga would eat them? Belugas, Arctic seals, foxes, wolves, seabirds, and the polar bear would be massive obstacles. And even though the great auk isn't around, penguins still do have to compete with their living relatives, with puffins and razorbills, along with other seabirds for food. Overall, it's just not the move, but who knows, maybe a colony could be successful, and maybe they could even live on the same islands that the great auks once did. The great auk is a fascinating bird, showing us convergent evolution and being able to adapt to the harsh northern Atlantic Ocean. But as successful as they were, we really failed them. Thankfully, it seems that man has learned not to let overhunting like this snowball out of control, or at least that's what I like to think. The world of our distant past was such a fascinating place. I mean, just 300 years ago, the Great Auk would have been a common sight to those living near the water. It's best to appreciate what we got, but it's also really important that we ensure that we keep animal populations in check, no matter how common or rare they are. I would hate for the people 300 years from now to be robbed of getting to see incredible animals that we have now. And that's going to do it for the Great Auk. Uh, this was a very cool subject to research. Uh, I, I've, like, I was just kind of brainstorming recently. What, what should I do? And they're like, oh, the great auk. Well, I mean, I guess we could talk about another extinct animal. We talked about the Florida fairy shrimp. So let's get another extinct animal in here. Um, I don't know. I could have probably talked about how people think they're around, but they're they're not around. I, it's just they're not there. Maybe maybe if like some sightings or something get reported, we could make a cryptid corner out of that. You know, that'd be pretty cool. But anyways, thank you for watching. Uh, this was fun to make. If you liked the video, make sure to like it. Comment down below what you think about it. And if you got any other suggestions for the Thursday videos. The Thursday videos take a bit more thinking. Oh, but next Thursday's video. I'm pretty sure next Thursday is Halloween. Let me check. Yeah, it is. It is Halloween. So I got a Halloween special plan for that one. I think it's going to be a Cryptid Corner special. I'm excited for it. I hope you're excited for it too. Because it's going to be one of my favorite cryptids. But... Anyways, uh, make sure to like the video if you liked it again, subscribe, ring that bell, hype the video, and until next time, see you later.